Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to um, today's screening. Um, this is the first program of our um, Asian Film Archives Reframe series called Screening the Forest. And before we begin the screening, I would like to uh, actually welcome um, the curator, uh, Dr. Greywood uh, Chupung Saton, to come up here to give us a little bit of lecture and to introduce his curation and what it means to present the Asian cinematic forest. Yeah. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Greywood Chupung Saton. Yeah, thank you. Hello, uh, thank, thank you very much for yeah, coming to this evening. And uh, first, first of all, I want to thank the Asian Film Archive yeah, for inviting me to curate this program, which is based on my PhD research yeah, that I conducted in, at uh, Queen Mary Uni University of London. Today's session will be divided into three ac activities, yeah, starting with my 25 to 30 minutes lecture, <laughs> yeah, and we will then see the short film program, yeah, and which is about eight, 85 minutes, yeah, and following, following that, yeah, we will end with a Q and A with uh, the direct, the directors, uh, Bu Jun Feng and Pimaka Toira. My discussion will be divided into two parts. Yeah, uh, to to begin, I will provide an 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 overview of my research, yeah, much of which will use language that is quite academic. Yeah. If you do not understand some parts or find it hard to follow, the overview will also in introduce yeah, the themes in the program, yeah, which will give you a better understanding of the themes that will be screened tomorrow and on Sunday. Uh, since the turn of this century, uh, the forest has become a subject that fascinates the new generation of global art filmmakers. These are people who have chosen the forest as a space for their creative ex ex exploration. Yeah. Though it is not an official phenomenon, filmmakers have not written a group manifesto, nor have film critics or film scholars named the movement. The act of filming in the forest has become an artistic practice adopted by global art filmmakers. Key filmmakers in global art cinema have established their auto status by presenting mysterious, philosophically resonant images of the forest. Many of them, including Abhishek Pongwira Setakun, Naomi Kawase, and Lisandro Alonso, have more than one forest film. In 2010 alone, the Asian Cinematic Forest took center stage at three of the world's most influential film festivals. The Berlin Film Festival, where Turkish director Semi Kamblanoglu won the top award for Hanni or Bao, the, the film on the top right. Yeah. The Cannes Film Festival, where Abhishek Pongre Setakun won the Palm d'Or for Uncle Bun Miu and Call His Past Life. And the Venice Film Festival, where Tran An Hu bewitched the audience with uh, Norwegian wood. The forest has not only been a recurring protagonist in the work of the individual filmmakers, but has also been explored by several cinematic movements in recent decades, such as the Berlin School movement and the so-called slow cinema movement. Love Diaz, the key filmmaker of the slow cinema, is also a significant figure in the, in the new Filipino cinema a movement in which many filmmakers express traumatic national histories by centering on the forest in those narratives. Of course, film scholars have already studied such themes by applying various frameworks. For example, the above-mentioned themes have been studied with the concept of film and nations in mind. The result was that the themes were understood as a, a, a cultural work being reflective of national characteristics and circulating beyond national borders. They have also been studied through the lens of the authorship, yeah, which is a way to understand film in relation to uh, signature style of the directors. Reception studies, gender studies, racial and post-colonial studies have also been investigated in regard to these themes. However, there is a tendency to marginalize the forest where when these frameworks are used, because the main focus you know, is on the nation or the national border or the director or the film circulation, the gender, the race, the audience, yeah, but not the forest. Yeah. So the question is, if I use the forest as a point of entry, yeah, 
what should the framework that I adopt to study the theme be? Moreover, I inspire myself by asking, how should I study the cinematic forest within the framework that has emerged in the film study scholarship and humanities overall in 21st century? In other words, in my research, I, want to, I wanted to match the forest themes made since 2000s with the frameworks and theories that have emerged in film studies scholarship over the same period. Yeah. That's why I, I look into the verse in the three turns of, theme, of humanities. Mm. Throughout the past decade, the humanities have experienced uh, both the animal and the non-human turns. I use the term turns to indicate a paradigm, uh, an academic paradigm shift. Yeah. We are familiar with the idea that humanities are academic disciplines that explore hu human society and human culture, whereas something that is not human, such as nature, yeah, we will yeah, leave it out for the scientists and biologists yeah, to focus on. Yeah. However, in the past decade, yeah, there has been a growing number of researchers and new disciplines yeah, in humanities, which question human specificity or explore the relationships between human species and other species. Mm. This includes the animal turn. During the animal turn, scholars in the humanities began to embrace the animal as an object of study. This turn began when traditional philosophy faced significant criticism from continental philosophers including Jacques, de, Jacques de, Derrida, yeah, for, for perceiving animals in reductive and essentialist terms. Such critics prompted the humanities to reconceptualize various aspects of thinking about animals, including their modes of being, their relationships, or their, their relations with humans, their distinction or their indistinction from humans and more general ideas of humanity, animality, and animal ethics. By some contrast, the non-human turn, which was heralded by Richard Grusin, emerged to defy the host of critical and theoretical accounts, including uh, actor network theory, new materialism, speculative realism, plant studies, and new media theories. All of these approaches Though they were in some in, in various degrees on, on multiple fronts, they all share the quest of post-anthropocentric ways of conceiving the world, a world in which humans have not only never been modern, as Bruno Lato suggests, but have also never been human. What is this? Human has never been human. Mm. Instead of being a clear-cut autonomous form of life, the human, quote, has always co-evolved, co-existed, or corroborated with the non-human, end quote. Apart from the animal and the non-human terms, we also need to be reminded how over the last two decades, there have been growing concerns and an in, an increase in recognition of, of the en environmental crisis. The town we live in has been redefined by geologists as the age of the Anthropocene the epoch in which humans are the main driving force on the Earth's system. Since humans are the driving force, several disciplines, including humanities and film studies, suddenly have a new mission, which is to rethink the relationship between humans and the Earth in the face of the climate crisis. Linking the forest with these three terms, the animal, the non-human, and the anthropocene, I gradually realized that the cinematic forest is, is full of promises. First, the cinematic forest is a good place to consider animal studies because some forest themes show a relationship between human and, and, and animals. Yeah. The cinematic for forest allows us to question the concept such as humanity, animality, and what happens when the two species meet are muted into one. Second, the cinematic forest is also a good place to think about the relationship between humans and non-humans, as films about forests do not only have human characters and animal characters, but other forms of en entities and forces, yeah, such as uh, plants, dust, rivers, caves, stones, ghosts, rites, and darkness. Yeah. 
the, the, the cinematic forest becomes a place in which human characters and human spectators encounter non-human en, en, entities. The meeting between humans and the non-humans allows us to consider politics, ethics, and aesthetics that cinema used to engage with the non-human world. Third, with a sense of urgency caused by ecological disaster, the forest has become part of a lively dialogue about the relationship between humans and the Earth, both today and in the future. Although I do not mean to imply that uh, from, e uh, from an ecological perspective, the forest matters more than other types of the natural environments. Cinema has revealed time and again that the forest is indeed a, priv a, a pri pri privileged site for exploring how humans engage with the Earth in the time of the ecological crisis. Throughout my research, I used two keywords to connect my musings about the cinematic forest and the three frameworks. The first keyword is post-anthropocentrism, and the second is agency. Post-anthropocentrism is a keyword found in animal studies, non-human studies, and the Anthropocene. Before we can understand post-anthropocentrism, post though, we need to understand anthropocentrism first. As a foundation, uh, the, the Cambridge Advanced Learners Dictionary defines anthropocentric as, quote, considering humans and their existence as the most important and central fact in the universe, end quote. And animal theorist Raleigh Gunn has complicated that definition, though, by further breaking it down into inevitable anthropocentrism and, and, and arrogant anthropocentrism. The first refers to ways in which humans perceive the world from a generally human perspective. Yeah. She said, we are humans and our, our perceptions are necessarily human, end quote. However, she also suggests that that notion can be revealed. Mm -hmm. That we experience the world from our perspective doesn't mean that we cannot work to see things from the from other perspective. Yeah. In contrast, the second definition represents a type of human ch chauvinism and the ways in which humans do not only position themselves as the center of all things, but also elevate, quote, human perspective above all others. In my research, I discuss anthropocentrism in both of these senses by looking for ways in which the, cin the cinematic forest may have the potential for or encounter, or encounter limits to decentralizing both types of anthropocentrism. Cinema can be highly anthropocentric because it highlights the human experience and perspective above, above the experience and perspectives of the non-human beings. Moreover, of course, cinema is made by humans and is watched by humans, so it is anthropocentric through and through. However, what I am interested in is the way in which anthropocentrism in its question or even terminated in a particular moment of cinematic forest films that result in a moment in which a vision of the world that is not human focused shines through. In other words, in my work, uh, I have looked for particular moments in which uh, in films about the forest that features moment in which anthropocentrism is questioned or terminated. For, for example, the synoptic forest in Jet Lagos, not a soul, which we will screen tomorrow. Uh, in this film, it has a moment that presents the world from a perspective beyond that of humans. This film is, uh, in this film, the director explores the forest, which, the, which the forest is a battlefield between two armed groups in, in, in the Philippines. But what the film shows is that in this forest, the world of insects coexist with the world of humans. Mm. The other example can be found in Abhishat Pongvira Setakun's Worldly Design, which we will also screen mm, tomorrow. In this film, there is a moment in which we sense that we are seeing the film from the perspective of the forest. In another way, the cinematic forest can be post-anthropocentric in the sense that it champions the human and the human-non-human the human relationship. When looking at Jin, the film that we will screen in the final day, the film that uh, there is a moment that acknowledges and attempts to understand the structure of life forms beyond human species. 
Ultimately, in the most radical way, the synoptic forest, in particular films, shows a version of the world that exists and operates without humans in it. The second key word is agency. To think about the cinematic forest purely in terms of animal, non-human, and the anthropocentric uh, and the anthropocene studies, we need to rethink the notion of agency. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines agency as, quote, an agent is a being with the capacity to act, and agency denotes the exercise or manifestation of this capacity. However, in philosophy and the social science, agency is applied less broadly and typically in, in association with notions of intentionality and consciousness. Although the term is used differently, most scholars in philosophy, the social science, and humanities agree that agency belongs to humans. This understanding of agency has resulted from a long-standing anthropocentric tradition in Western philosophy that understands human as the only beings with consciousness and intentionality. Over the past decade, however, attempts to redefine agency in Western thought has cast doubt upon, if not subverted, the idea that, of all things, only humans possess agency. Instead of granting agency solely to humans, Various disciplines have extended the notion of agency to characterize an ability shared by various non-human forms, whether it is uh, animals, plants, materials, and the like. More often, we read new research that highlights the consciousness of animals or that suggests that plants can communicate to, with each other. There is also a trend in philosophy that gives agency to objects and other forces as well. Situating the forest in this definition of agency, we find that the forest is a space full of agencies, whether or not it belongs to humans. Cinema is also a good place to explore this new definition of agency. Why? Because cinema, since its, since its in inception, has been an art form that, acknowledge, uh, that acknowledges the agency beyond that of humans. If we return to early cinema, uh, specifically, the time before cinema was redefined as a narrative medium. We see that it is a medium that acknowledges non-human agency. One amazing example is Baby's Dinner, one of the, 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 the Lumiere brothers' first films. In this film, it depicts uh, one of the, the Lumiere brothers and his wife feeding their baby against a backdrop of trees blowing in the wind. The one-shot actuality films presents human in the foreground. Yeah. However, there is a record that what the spectators in those days, yeah, in nearly 100 years ago, what the spectators were fascinated by this film was not the baby, but the wind in the trees in the background. In a sense, that idea is the best manifestation of non-human agency on screen that even without a cinematic manipulation of space and time, cinema is a space that acknowledges the non-human lives. Moreover, we can find, acknowledge, find acknowledgments of non-human agency in early film theory, specifically the theory of photogeny by Chong Epstein, the, the French uh, film theorist and filmmaker. Epstein argues that cinema holds an animistic power to shine a light on an inner life of things, or even breathe life into things on screen. He wrote, quote, if we wish to understand how an, an animal, a plant, or a stone can inspire respect, fear, and horror, we must watch them on the screen, living their mysterious, silent lives, alien to human sensibility. Yeah. Thinking about the synthetic forest, in light of this new definition of agency, the forest is not simply a lifeless background for human characters. Instead, I propose that the forest is a zone of contact. It is a network of en entities, a, a, a special temporal setting in which, all in which all entities relate and in which those, those relations actively shape the forest altogether. The entities in the Network range from the human, the animal, the plants, the 
two forms of matter and force. In the forest, their agencies are located in their entanglements, and many levels of agency exist, from those arising from brief encounters to all forest agency arising from the assemblage of a host of entities. Entities in the forest also include whatsoever, what, whatever is in front of the camera, behind it, the camera and the, and the audio recording equipment themselves, and the visual and, and audio effects. In that entanglement of images and sound, with humans and non-human entities, meaning and effect emerge. Moreover, the forest is also a contact zone between the forest itself and the viewers. Throughout many films in this program, there are recurring images of the forest that suggest that the forest does not just interact with the characters on screen, but is itself a character which projects some sort of force and sense and power to the audience. Okay, then about the film in the program. Mm -hmm. I divide the categories of film in the program into three sub-categories. Okay, first aesthetics. Uh, when I watch the film in the program all together, there are many styles and strategies of representation. Yeah. I want to highlight some ideas in terms of the aesthetics of these forest films. Firstly, because many films in the program highlight the, the, agency, the, the agency of the forest, I found that many films do not have much dialogue. Yeah. In some films, there is not a single word at all. They are, li they are li replaced by images and sounds of the forest. This idea of non-dialogue relates to the aesthetics of uh, slow, slow cinemas. Yeah. Two, films, yeah, two films in the program uh, can be categorized as a, as a slow cinema, and that's two films, uh, Dodo De Yao's uh, Entropy Machine, yeah, which we will screen today, and Li Yong Zhao, Black Amber, which we will screen on Sunday. These kinds of films play with the long tape, the stillness, the boredom, yeah, and the relationship between cinema and time. In a way, they recreate the sense that in the forest, there is no time. Secondly, many films in the program resulted from a one-to-one -one experience between a filmmaker and a forest. By this I mean that instead of a full film crew, the director alone carry a com camera and enter into the forest. Mm. Films that fall under this category include a, a raw video, which is the first film in today's program. Yeah. In it, the director randomly captures images during his trip to a, a village. Yeah. Uh, also included in this category are not a soul, Mantis Tales, The Brief, and Naomi Kawasaki's The Bill, which will be screened tomorrow. Mm. Li Yong Zhao's Black Amber also fits into this category. Of course, many films in the program were made by full production team going into the forest. And I would like to highlight this idea of film crew working in the forest as a sub-theme of the program. We find this narrative trope in Abhishat Pong's Vira Setakun's Worldly Design, which is a film within the film in which Abhishat Pong observes a film crew shooting in the forest. I also include Pim Pimbagato Vira's trailer for the Thai Shop Film Festival. Yeah, as it shows an image of film crew in the forest as well. Mm. I also want to point out the double bill of uh, Abhishek Pongre Sadakun and Naomi Kawase uh, that, we will be, that we will screen them tomorrow. My concept of pair, pairing these, uh, them all together is that both Vira Sadakun and Kawase come from the same generation of Asian filmmakers. Yeah. And now, yeah, both of them become like a, a master of Asian films. Yeah. Both of them are also famous for the, the natural world in their films. But what I am interested in is the way in which both filmmakers return to the forest again and again in order to make new films. It is as if there is something in the forest that they are still hungry for. As a result, instead of showing the forest film, instead of showing their famous forest films such as Tropical Maladi, Uncle Boon Me, yeah, I intentionally select the films that they made after their famous films. Interestingly, after making a, a fictional feature about the forest, both filmmakers return to the forest 
But this time, they decided to make a documentary about the forest and people in the forest. I also would like to emphasize that images of the forest have a history of their own. This is why I chose to screen Tony Wu's Legend in the Mist, as the footage of this film yeah, came from a martial art film made by King Hu. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next is politics. When discussing politics, uh, oh, sorry, the way I say it, many of the films in the program present the forest as an archive of traumatic political history. The forest, building in this light, yeah, the forest is a forgotten, is a forgotten crime scene, a world with a secret, a place for alternative memories, and a space for histories suppressed suppressed or written off by the dominant trends in historiography. In giving rise to this theme, many films in the program echo trauma, the existence of the unspeakable, and a mode of remembrance that cannot be articulated. In today's screening, we will see this form of forest in Bujun Feng's mirror and Pimpakato Viras, the Purple Kingdom, and Nguan Tuin Ti, landscape series number one, which will be screened tomorrow. In these films, something has disappeared in the forest, you know, or the forest hide something. Yeah. The forest may preserve the body of a lover, a national hero, or a secret. We can sense it, but we cannot see it because the forest has covered it. Yeah. I, I would also like to mention the film by Ken Chan, yeah. The, the title is Sunny Act 1, 2, 3, which we will screen tomorrow. The film used the tropical forest as a place to reimagine Singapore's art history. Mm. The theme of the alternative history can also be applied to two films, yeah, which we will screen tomorrow. Uh, the, film, the two films' titles are Kam Chon San Guan and An Invalid Throne. These two films are about a forest, mm, about the same forest yeah, in Thailand, being a politically resonant and commodified space. These two films were made by the same team of filmmakers, though one is a documentary and projected with a, with a, di di with, with a digital projection, and the other is a fiction and projected with a 35mm uh, projection. Mm which is uh, a rare chance to, to see in this day. Yeah, it's a rare chance to see the full projection of 35 millimeters yeah, film. The final program, uh, Li Yong Chao's uh, Blood Embers, also deals with a political, also deal with political e ecologies. Yeah. The film is a documentary about Taiwanese people who travel to northern Burmese forests to work as a miners. Mm. What makes Black Amber different is the, the director's realistic sense, sense, sensibility. We sense that the filmmaker doesn't just make a film about minors, but he lives with minors for months. Yeah. Unlike many films which, which present forest as an enchanting space, the forest for the minors in Black Amber is a working space, a space of boredom, and a space in which they will immediately live once they discover a piece of amber under the ground. Finally, there is an underlying theme of ecological catastrophe in the program, particularly in two of the films. Today we will see Party by Indian photographer Sorapura, which is the only film in the, in the whole program that does not have an image of the forest. The forest absence, though, is the point of the film, and it is about a, a village that once was a forest, but was transformed into a, a, a desert by the deforestation. Jin by Turkish filmmaker Rihal Erdem also deals with a similar theme, yeah, and we will screen this film on Sunday. Yeah. From afar, this film is, li is like many other war films or human rights films. It is about a paramilitary teenage girl who wants to quit her role as a soldier and leave the war. Yet, the film slowly becomes a, a met metaphor for humans and Earth. 
and the war that humans perpetuate on the earth. In many films about war, we see humans are the victims of the battle. This film, though, describes how humans, animals, and the forest share the stage as war victims. Okay, I think I talked enough. <laughs> so, okay, uh, next we will screen the short film program and then we will, we will yeah, return with the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Greywood. So, just a reminder that after the screening, we'll be having a Q&A session um, moderated by Greywood himself, and we also are very lucky today to have two of the directors of the short films, um, Mr. Bujin Fong and Ms. Pimba Kataweira. So, stay tuned for that and stay, stay with us after the screening, and with that, we'll start the, sh start the screens very shortly after we remove this. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the uh the his, historical period that you play with yeah, in the in the film. Um, actually, I I rather not look at it in in history terms uh, or or specific periods of history um, because I I don't think that was what um, I I sought to do in in creating uh, the the film. Um, for me, uh, as you we were talking about earlier, um, how one experiences uh, the forest. Um, for me, actually, uh, before I became a filmmaker, uh, where I needed to go on location recce and things like that and experience the forest as a filmmaker in, in search of locations, um, I, I, I never used to be outdoorsy. So uh, my, my only experience with the forest was when I was serving in the military. Um, and so, so that, that the, the, the smell, the, the sounds uh, of the forest. Uh, sometimes nowadays when I go on an early morning shoot in the forest, um, I, the, the smell and the sound still brings me back to the, the day I was enlisted and I, I had to um, be in the forest uh, as a soldier. Uh, and so, so it was very evocative that way when I was at Bukit Brown and, and what, what I wanted to do and so, so the, the character of the soldier came to mind um, and also how timeless the space felt. Um, I wanted to just kind of mirror different realities that that forest or that cemetery uh, brought. Yeah. And uh, you have just said that for this work, uh, the, the or origin of this work is that you try to challenge yourself because you need to make a piece for the uh, Sing Singapore Art Museum. But what, what about uh, seeing the, this version today? Because this like, uh, re returns to the or orig not, not, not original form, but it turned to the single screen form. Yeah, because at, at this moment, actually, this work can be viewed as, a, as an installation. Right. Actually, it's the first time I'm seeing it in the cinema. Yeah. Uh, I, I sent you the file uh, yeah. because you asked to show it in the, in, in the cinema. Uh, and I've never seen it in this context before. Uh, and I kind of regret putting credits to it because uh, it's not, it, it just didn't feel right when the credits came up. Uh, because it was me, it was me, uh, with the idea that it, it will be perpetually on loop, yeah. you know, um, because when he wakes up uh, again and then the thing just repeats itself and it repeats itself. So I, I kind of, when I saw the, the, the credit, I, I just, uh, like, I, I wish it just ended there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, because it, it worked, but as I was explaining to you, um, uh, yeah, it, it is seen now still in the gallery, but. Uh, but in the cinema context, I think uh, the, the audience expectation is also a little bit different. Uh, it's not a, a, a sort of a transient uh, or, or, or an audience that is moving. It is it is a captive audience. So, so I thought it, it could be a different experience. Uh, and actually, the sound sounds a lot better here than any gallery can offer. I think. So uh, yeah, it's my first time experiencing it like that as well. Okay, for uh, Pimpaka, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I want to ask you, maybe you can give a little bit of introduction for this case. Yeah, because the yeah. film was mm. made from um, the real famous case in, in Thailand. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's one of the quite important uh, in, uh, enforced disappearance in Thailand. And the, because uh, maybe I can, I actually know the Billy, you know, Billy, because it's like, I used to uh, do a conduct a workshop for the ethnic people in the north. And actually, Billy was not in the workshop, but I mean, like, you know, I mean, like, some of them, you know, are a kind of connection to the, that guy, Billy. We actually also try to involve in the filmmaking. Because he thought that, you know, if he can make a film about, you know, his, you know, the issue, because it's an issue of, you know, the land, like, he actually part of that. And you can see, like, uh, the old guy, you know, uh, he actually, like, 105 years. And he has been forced for his home to be in other place. Like, you know, in, in which, you know, like, you know, burn his house and, you know, and burn life's barn. So uh, Billy is a grand, uh, is a grand child, grandchildren, and he would like to make a film in order to, you know, export about the, the story, yeah. So, and then I think it's also part of evidence, you know, because he also, you know, uh, like, uh, has uh, filed a lawsuit against the, the, ch the chief uh, of the national park. And then so become the reason why he uh, got detrained and missing after that. So it's a kind of, you know, like, uh, the, this kind of issue is quite common in Thailand, you know, if you read all the newspaper. And the uh, Billy case is also one of uh, quite important, uh, I mean, uh, uh, reinforced his appearance because it's also dealing with the uh, kind of, you know, like uh, a conflict, you know, in the national park where people know that who actually, you know, get the benefit from that. So I want to be in them, them you know, you can, you can Google it if you interested. But I mean, for me, you know, when I learned that he disappeared, I didn't know her, his wife, but I mean, I, I know him, I mean, through the, my friend who actually uh, conducted a workshop with him. So I got, uh, like, a, this is a commission work by uh, the Law Reform Association. So I picked this case because I got, like, I have been asked to do a kind of commission film regard to, regarding to any case. So I picked this case. And I went to meet uh, the, the Billy wife who actually appeared in the film. She actually the actual wife of Billy who disappeared. And I did interview with her and then, you know, I spent time with her and I think I would like to ask her to be in the film. And nobody thought that I can ask her in the film. Because people quite, because it's not, it's quite risky for her, you know. And, and when I asked her whether she would like to be in the film, she actually has to consult with the lawyer because the case is still going on. And then, you know, I, you know, the, uh, so that's why, you know, the film look a bit like, you know, you might see a bit like a, a bit documentary at the same time, the fiction. Because I don't want to make a documentary. I would like to create the uh, reality uh, from her memory. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the story. And, and, and I mean, most of the scene, uh, I mean, shooting about her is from her memories. Not only really about the real memory, but also like her from her dream. There's some f the scene that where you know she looking for her children is part of her dream. So it's like uh, the film. I not actually written anything. I just written from what she told me. So this is a part of her, and also the other part where it's actually totally fiction. I also uh, wrote it for in purpose. It's a kind of make the contrast. Uh, and what what about the the old man? Yeah, is that's Koi? Is, yeah. yeah, is is he is he the real? Yes, grand he's the real grandfather of Billy, yeah. and we sneaky uh interview him because he lived very very far in the national park, and if the official file us, you know, we he would be in trouble. It's not us; he would be in trouble. So it's like we just took one day up to the, in the heart of the national park and interviewed him. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, uh, 100 and 
six now. Yes. Uh, yeah, he's very old, and he's also, you know, he, he could not sleep, he could not see well. You know. So it's very hard for us to, I mean, like, to talk to him, too. Yeah. And about, about Billy's Bill, Bill, wife, can you talk a little bit more about the, the detailed process that how did you work with, with her act, act, acting? Or, or it means, I mean, did you, do you ex, expect yeah, much from her? Or what do you expect from her in terms of her performance? Be I mean, um, in the beginning, when I, before I'm traveling to meet her in, uh, in, in her home, I'm not so sure whether she can, you know, be in in my film because you know what is I I did some, you know, uh, I working with a non-professional before, and I know that it's very difficult, you know, when they in in front of the camera they a bit like I mean conscious like to the camera, so but why we talking? Why I you know spend time with her and I thought she she's a quite uh, I mean like she's very quite I mean. The way that you look in the film is the way that I found her, you know. So it's like I I quite sure, you know. After we spent time, and and I and I thought and I quite sure that she can be in the film, even though it's just a bit like in the beginning she's a bit quite reluctant, you know, to to be on the screen. And then you know during the time of the you know the, during the process of filmmaking, she's a bit quite okay. And the thing is like because I think because she are uh, ethnic like ethnic uh, person, so she cannot speak Thai, I mean like she had an accent. So for her, this is something that she a bit like not comfortable. And you can, because you probably not understand, but for us, you know, as Thai and you know, ethnic people, and they, they mostly, they a bit like uncomfortable to speak accent in Thai. Uh -huh. So it's something you can have a sense of that in her look. Yeah. But I think she's so brave for me, you know. I'm, I'm, I mean, like I'm, and he, and she, like you know, because I'm, I never thought that she accept to be in the film, yeah. because for her it's really quite risky, you know, because the film could be part of the, the lawsuit. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. something that we have to be aware of, so we cannot use her real name in the in the film. So I asked her to, you know, to file the new name. When she's, you know, telling about her. Yeah. 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 Uh, can I change the subject a little bit into, uh, how did you find uh, uh, the idea of filming in the forest? Because as as long as I know you, you have made so many films in the forest, yeah, and it's t tomorrow uh, in Abishas yeah, Pong's. Yeah. Film, yeah. In that <laughs> film, Abhishek Pong invited Pim, Pimpaka to make a film in the forest, and then Abhishek Pong made a documentary about Pimpaka's making film in the forest. <laughs> so, I mean, honestly, I'm a bit quite afraid, you know, work, making a film in the forest, you know, because I'm, I, f I think it's like forest is so mysterious, and, and I'm afraid of the animals, you know, and honestly, you know, especially snake. <laughs> I'm a snake phobia. So, you know, it's like, you know, if, I don't know why, because it's, but it's not about, it's not, I mean, I'm not like, fascist, fascist, fascist I'm, I'm not like, you know, the forest not motivate me to chew the film, but I mean, the story wise and, you know, the character wise that, you know, moved me to be chewed the film in the forest. That's what I found myself. And I don't know why recently I, we, I have been shooting a lot of short film in the forest. Because of the, I think it's because of the story and character. Because I, yeah, that, and I think, you know, like, that's why, you know, I'm, when I portray the forest in my film, something that, you know, is a bit like mysterious, you know. Because this is something dealing in my internal. Because when I'm shooting, you know, I, my crew know that, you know, what I fear. You know, what if they see something that, you know, you can ask my AD there. You know what, when we shoot the film, because they know that I'm snake phobia. So I told them, if you see any kind of snake, don't say any word. Because otherwise, I, I will run from the forest, you know. And you know what, the, the, the place that we, shoot, we shot the film, is plenty of, of snakes. 
and they didn't say any words during the shooting. But I hear like, you know, something moving, you know, and I, but I never seen them. And then after we finished the shooting, my AD told me, oh, you, I have, we have to say something. We have important thing to you. <laughs> there are a lot of snakes there and they're very quite dangerous. <laughs> okay, I think now it's time yeah, for the question from the viewers. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a roving mic around if anyone wants to ask any questions, and I think this also includes uh, Greywood if you have any questions for the curator as well. So there's one question right there first. We can answer maybe about, um, due to time, maybe um, two, uh, three or four questions. Yeah. Hi, thank you for um, sharing your films and, and talking about it. I have questions for all three of you. Um, maybe I'll just I'll just say my questions briefly and then you can answer as you wish. Uh, Jin Fong, your film, so it's very clearly something that you want as an aesthetic exploration or an experiment. Why did you then title it Mirror? Um, does it have anything to do with perhaps the autobiographical inspiration or maybe something else other than that? Aside from obviously the, uh, the framing of the, of the short film. And also I thought that it felt really more like a moment than anything else and it started out of nowhere and it ended out of nowhere. And, and I know it's supposed to be in a loop, but why not drag it out further? There was so much more, I think, that um, I wanted to, to learn from it. So it was very absorbing in that way. So that's my question. And for Pipaka, um, I think my question was uh, more to do with your decision maybe to, to add in a kind of very pop and light element to it, to what was a very heavy story. And, you know, strangely, and I think that's a lot of credit to your direction, it didn't take away at all from the gravity of the situation, the levity of that music. And so why did you decide to take that risk? And uh, what measures did you take to make sure that it paid off? And uh, for Greywood, um, I look forward to the other films and maybe we can have a conversation about that uh, when everything else is over. So why did you pick um, such different films to put together for the first program? Um, maybe you can say something more about that. I'm particularly, int particularly interested in the one with the three frames taken from, I, I, I assume, what was martial art movies from Hong Kong. Thank you. I guess I'll answer first because my, my answer is quite short. Uh, uh, well, I, I didn't know what to title it. <laughs> So, uh, and, and I guess when you don't know how to title a work, you just think of it formally, what, what makes most sense, and I just called it a mirror, because uh, it's, it's actually, in the gallery, it was a two, two projection, uh, sorry, two channel projection. So it's on two walls that are 90 degrees. Uh, so if you were standing right in the middle, it actually does feel like a, a mirror, uh, a mirror image of, of, one, of one of the other. Yeah, so, so, yeah. <laughs> I think for me, it's, uh, it's, it's like, you know, I, because I don't want to make a, a kind of, you know, like a documentary film where, you know, we just see like, uh, you know, the, the hardship of the, the character. And I would like to, I mean, go, I would like to like you know to make a kind of contrast you know it's like because the the the, the situation in Thailand you know it's not about the the issue but it's about you who actually who you know for, I I may put it that way I need to make a contrast like you know in the, you know some sometimes you have you have someone you know like your love disappear like uh, you know the the current wife. We actually, you know, have a husband missing, and also at the same time, you know, also the a young woman who actually also lost her husband. But I mean, the way that both of them looking for their own love, you know, is the way also, you know, how they can connect to the person that can help them. It's something like, you know, kind of, you know, like a represent a kind of Thai society. It's like, you know, who is the power that you can gain from the relationship. So something that I would like to make the contrast. So that's why I use the pop song. Because in order like, you know, to make it more fiction and more like, you know, like a, like a fake, you know, tale. It's like a fake tale, you know, something like that. You know? So that's why I make this kind of decision. 
And I, I mean, honestly, I didn't like this song. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> That's why I put that too. Yeah. Uh, for me, the okay, the question is that why I choose many many different styles of film to pack within one program. This. This is not the first time that I program the films in the theme of the forest. Yeah, the last time that I program it, yeah, it turns out that I I chose uh, the films in the in that program. I they the the aesthetics in each film they are too too close to each other, and and it's like it it it. it the films are all fused into one film. Yeah, for for the audience, it's like the audience cannot you know, dif dif differentiate yeah, between one for another, which which I think it is uh, an in interesting aspect. But for for this uh, if even because I have five slots, yeah. So for the first slot, I want to show like the the the, the varieties that uh, and the audience can ex expect that okay yeah there are varieties and themes and styles and especially for this screening i try to uh, i try to contrast one film with the next film with the next film yeah because i i am afraid that the audience will fall asleep or something like that yeah so it's like you you can see that i i start with like a, a very talk talkative film and then a, a, a very a very non dialogue film and then a very talkative film and then a very non dialogue film so it's like i try to like shake the audience yeah up a little bit yeah Hi, this question is directed to all three of you. So going by this kind of programs and with your own words that was shown here, I realized that there's a lot of violence that's going on, be it, you know, coming from the ambient, the sound, or, you know, even the way that it's filmed, the cinematography or the thematic matter for Pimpakas especially, it's very violent, even though it's very, so very quiet. So my question here actually is with regards to how do you feel that violence is interpreted differently in a forest as opposed to an urban setting? Because in, you know, in an urban setting with concrete and human activity, violence is something that's very mundane. It has part of a statistic, it's part of the social fabric, but in a forest where it is detached from humanity in a way, but also kind of intrinsic to its value as nature. Do you feel that this interpretation has a difference? And if there is, would you mind just elaborating on your take? I'm first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I think yeah you hit the right point here yeah. because yeah when I think when people think about the forest yeah people think about something like yeah, peaceful and yeah all those of things yeah but when I look into themes about the forest yeah and as as I uh, said in my lecture yeah in in many films about the forest yeah it becomes a theme about a, a a crime scene, yeah. It's like the forest become a, a crime scene, but but it is not as 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 static crime scene because the, we need to think about the forest in relation to the the growth of plants and the change of yeah everything in the forest, right? Yeah, in in a way the the texture of the forest yeah help to cover the the crumb, yeah, and uh, the growing of the trees can, yeah, if you lost something or if you uh, hide a, a, a corpse, yeah, you cannot find it because, yeah, it will, yeah, cover by the trees and then, uh, and then the, the body of a man will transform into a part of the forest or something like that. So I, I quite like this, this idea and how it, yeah, 
what's played out in the cinematic medium. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to respond, but I, what I found, you know, from the cases about the rainforest disappearing in Thailand is like, you know, most of them, you know, disappear in the forest. And people believe that they either be killed and then, you know, the body probably like, you know, cover in the forest or, you know, like, I mean, like, for example, like for Billy case, there's uh, some theory that, you know, he actually was killed in the forest, in the national park. And he probably uh, covered by the, the concrete where they're building the building. This is something that we heard. And there's also several kind of, you know, like enforced disappearance in Thailand where they, you know, probably more violence than we thought. Maybe I can add more. Uh, for this question, I am thinking about my, my thesis. Ex Actually, my my research is not just only about the the forest in Asian films here, yeah, because I I dedicate one chapter for the whole Holocaust here, yeah, because yeah, in if you look into the the history of the of the Hol Hol Holocaust, um, all of the ex extermination camp was built within the forest yeah. Yeah, because the 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 Nazis plant the forest, plant the 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 pine trees, yeah, yeah, and to to protect, yeah, people or villagers to see, yeah, to see what they did in the camp, yeah, and and when and when the camp was dem demolished, yeah, uh, the Nazis also grown a forest, yeah, over the camp. Yeah, so it's like you know, the forest become an agent that yeah help to uh makes the uh, help to e eradicate all of the e e evidence. Yeah, and I think yeah this this idea and what you ask here yeah, can yeah link to each other that the forest can be a very violent place. Perhaps just um well in in. My work, the, I guess I was also responding a lot to um, the, the controversy of, of Bukit Brown being, um, I mean, all these graves being exhumed and, um, and what it was, uh, and the violence that was inflicted on a, on a space uh, that would otherwise be so tranquil, um, the, the, the supposed final resting place uh, of the thousands that were buried there um, and and I just felt um, yeah I just felt the, the injustice um, uh, of it um, and and also I mean as I was working on, on it I did my research on what Bukit Brown was it also it also used to be uh, it was one of the last battle um, uh, one of the bloodiest battles that led to the fall of uh, Singapore to the Japanese uh, was there as well, and and that also just led me to think about how timeless, um, or rather how how, how historical. What, what do we mean by a historical uh, place? You know, and, and, and the trees and and, and the, the vegetation and the the, the, the <coughs> life there had witnessed um, so much uh, violence uh, in its in its time, and. And how, in the coming years or months, when I was making that, that this this highway was going to be constructed right across it, uh, and yeah, that the ugliness of it, and that was a part of the reason why I I, I thought of making it into a split screen too, because, um, because the that that line, uh, right across, uh, was was the only sort of inorganic, uh, straight line. Uh, that 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 the viewer will experience, uh, and so and of course in the gallery space, uh, formally it allowed me to to do that. Uh, so yeah. Well, maybe we have time for just one last question. If anyone has any 
last thoughts um, for any of the three of them today? Okay, this is one last one. Hi, um, I have uh, two questions. The first question is for Jun Fang's work. Um, I'm just wondering, um, in terms of the direction that you give to the actor, because it's the same actor, but it's in a way he's playing two roles. What's the What's the direction that you gave to him in that scene when he met the body on the ground? And then for Pimpaka, my question is about: Can you talk about the significance of the um, the trees being the tree being chopped? Uh, actually, when I was working on on this, I I. I was constantly questioning uh, my craft uh, because first, I mean, I was given a completely different canvas this time than I was what I was used to. So, I I, I wanted to open it up um, to to processes that I, I hadn't done before. Uh, for example, going to the forest and, and and literally going to the cemetery and just lying down among the graves with my the actor and some of the crew, and just just feeling like if, if you were buried there and what, what that would feel like, you know, if this was your, your final resting spot, you know, can we appreciate the beauty that it was, it was giving us? Uh, and it was really beautiful. It was, you know, even though it was a very hot day, but you know, you're just lying there and, and, and you're just hearing the leaves, uh, experiencing the ground, um, the coolness of the ground. Uh, and it was, so I, so I, I think, um, and then when it came to directing Irfan, uh, who is a, a, a playwright, uh, but also a, a, I guess he acts for theatre and sometimes for videos as well. Um, uh, I think it was uh, it was very much kind of a, a, a more theatre kind of a process where where through that blocking, um, he kind of just naturally understood the, the emotion that he would feel uh, experiencing uh, this body in the forest that could possibly be, hit, be his. Um, and, and it was the complexity of that that, that came through in, in what was in his eyes, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Actually, uh, it's like I, I mentioned before, it's like, you know, the story actually is not for me. Actually, it's from, you know, the wife of Billy. So there are also some scene that you know also part of the dueling we we is like we talking not not like interview we talk because I also lost my you know like I just also lost my cross uh, sister a few years ago so every time you know when I have the feeling like I would like to see her I would like to see her because it's a, the dream is can you can meet her in the dream only. So when we have the conversation with her, with uh, Munor, who actually the wife of Billy, we also have the same sense of that. You know? We're talking about the dream. So that's why you know the scene that where you see uh, the the children you know play after uh, the tree, and then there's some uh, like official try to chop the tree. It's part of her dream. This is the dream that she dreamed before the, the Billy disappeared. So that's why I intentionally to make it. It's not actually exactly the same, but something a bit like, you know, the tree, she dreamed that, you know, the, the real dream that she dreamed is like, she dreamed like, you know, she like, she, 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 lo she looking, she saw like a children praying. I mean, there is, there is, and praying around the tree, the big tree, like in the film. And then the tree was burned by an official. But we cannot burn the, the tree you know, because we shot the film in the park, in the national park, <laughs> and we illegal shot the film in the national park. So we cannot burn the tree. So I share the, like, to be a kind of chopping on the tree. It's also part of her dream. Yeah. Okay, with that, um, um, of course, uh, very proud that we presented um, Jun Feng's mirror today for the first time in a cinematic um, setting. We're also very proud that we actually got to premiere Pimbaka's films, including the trailer that you watched.
the crew <laughs> doing stuff. <laughs> and of course, the Purple Kingdom as well. And um, yeah, of course, Screen of Forest um, still has four more sessions over this weekend, tomorrow and on Sunday. If you're still interested, please tell your friends. Um, you can actually buy the tickets at the door, go to the website, see the lineup. Uh, brochures ran out, but you know, you can always find online. And with that, yes, lastly, I'd like to thank um, today's um, guests, Jin Fong, of course, Greywood, and Bim Parker. And thank you for, for staying with us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>